Hi, everyone. Um, I think we'll get started soon. Um, so welcome to the Applying to Grad School uh, workshop. Um, BSA usually does a workshop like this um, for the plant students. And if you don't know what the plants grant is, if you are an undergrad, uh, you should definitely apply. Um, but basically, uh, they, these sessions are typically just spaces for you to learn about how to apply to grad school. Um, and I've been to a few of these and I did not particularly enjoy the um, form that it was organized in. And so um, I helped uh, Carolina and the rest of the Early Career Professional Development Committee um, organize this session because uh, I wanted it to be better than the ones that I had been to. So what we have today are um, a few panel members who are, um, they, they have either currently or in the past um, worked in admissions in their current department at their university. And so they will have a lot of good information for you to ask about how to do grad school things. And we're really mostly gonna focus on the admissions process because there are a lot of um, questions that you can have about a lot of different parts of the whole, the whole grad school process. So um, this will just be a Q&A. So I think we would like the panelists to introduce themselves. And then we have a few questions to get you started, but for the most part, like this is all you. If you have questions, now is the place to ask. Um, we can re like the workshop will only be as good as all the questions you provide um, the panelists to answer. Um, so yeah, if uh, any any of the panelists would like to introduce themselves, or if Carolina, you want to introduce yourself at all, um, yeah, thanks um, for. Thanks, Amenia. I'll just say hi really quick. I'm Carolina Hiduk. Um, I'm co-organizing this but mostly Amenya did a lot of it. Um, and we're happy to have you here and hopefully this can be helpful to you. Um, just really quick, I'll, I was gonna put it in the chat, but I'll just say it. If you do have a question, either use the chat function. You can uh, directly message either myself or Amenya if you don't wanna say it publicly or put it to everybody. Um, and then otherwise, please use the raise hand button so that we can maintain some kind of uh, order to, to the Q and A. Um, and then I will go ahead and call on folks to introduce themselves from the panelists, um, starting with Chris. Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Martin. I teach at Bucknell University in central Pennsylvania. We fall under the sort of primarily undergrad institution kind of umbrella, but we do have a, a master's program. So we are a master's granting institution. So I represent sort of the small college that also has a, a master's program. Happy to answer questions for you today. Thanks. Um, Chris also advises undergrads and probably has a perspective from that perspective as well. Um, Liz, Elizabeth. No, Liz is fine. Okay. <laughs> I thought so. I wasn't sure. Yeah, though. yeah no, it's fine. <laughs> um, my name is Liz Haswell, and um, I'm at, in the biology department at Washington University in St. Louis, and I am the admissions director for the plant and microbial biology PhD program there. So I can sort of represent the more molecular uh, direction that some plant scientists go and more of that sort of R1 experience. Awesome, thanks. Jennifer? I am Jennifer Lackwitz. I'm at Montana State University. We have a plant sciences and plant pathology department often focused on um, very applied agricultural work. And we have both uh, PhD and master's programs spanning plant genetics and plant pathology. Awesome, and Chase. Hi there. Uh, so I'm the assistant graduate program director for uh, our master's and PhD programs here at the University of Central Florida in the Department of Biology. Our master's program is sort of a general biology master's and our PhD program is in integrative and conservation biology. Awesome, thank you so much. And thanks again, panelists, for being here. We really appreciate it um, for taking time out of your day today. Um, Emmanuel, do you wanna, I have to figure out a setting really quick in Zoom. Do you wanna ask our first question? 
to get us started. And again, for those who are here, um, prospective graduate students, please feel free to use the chat for questions. We'll try to keep track of those and, uh, and or raise your hand if you are able to. I'm trying to figure out if you actually can. Yeah, the raise hand feature is under the reactions thing at the bottom of Zoom. Um, so I guess one big question that I had when I was applying to grad school, and we can use this question to get started, is how important are undergraduate grades and or GPA into uh, getting into grad school? I'm happy to start off. <laughs> we had this discussion actually about um, a couple students last year, and I would say that good grades can really help, but if you have some not so great grades, it's still okay. What we wanna look for is a trajectory upwards, right? So if you struggled in freshman, your first semester of biology and you got a C, like, that's fine as long as we can see that your grades are getting better. But if your grades are dropping, then that might be a problem. So we do look at the transcript and look at sort of the overall picture of where grades are going more than the absolute number, the GPA. And I can follow, just confirm what, what... Elizabeth, Liz, I'm not sure which one to say, uh, had to say, but I do appreciate that point, right? So even on our official admissions page, it does say you should have a 3.0 in your science courses, but, right, and then there's this sort of like a disclaimer that says like it's more about trajectory, it's more about how you've done more recently, and and then a lot of the fields that we are grad advisors in, um, so much of it is, is whether or not you made that connection with a potential advisor, right? And those people kind of can become your advocates during the admissions process, whatever your GPA might be, right? And uh, uh, if you've made a good impression and sort of have made it clear that you're ready to go, right? There, there's a lot to be said for that, so. Yeah, we um, have a similar strategy that to what Chris just described. So students often contact a professor and identify that they might wanna work with them and we don't have a strict GPA or grade threshold. And so if there are um, other experiences that override you know poor grades at some time or another that would definitely be taken into account and like you said having that faculty interested faculty member to sponsor you and advocate for that um here in our program um we use a rubric for admissions so everyone's evaluated in the same sort of criteria and so gpa factors in about 10 percent of that total score so um if you do it, it, if you have a really high GPA, it can help compensate for, say, maybe having less research, undergrad research experience. Um, but if one has a lower GPA, it can easily be overwhelmed by, say, having undergrad research experience or other or other um, uh, extracurriculars that are relevant to uh, the um, field of interest or the particular kinds of, of work that a student plans on doing. Awesome, thank you, everybody. Um, we have a question, so we'll go ahead and um, let Barty ask. Sorry if I said your name incorrectly. Yeah, yeah, it's perfect, thank you. Um, hello, and thank you for being have holding this. This, this is so informative. Um, my name is Barty, and I actually just graduated from CSU East Bay here in California uh, with my Master's of Science, which was awesome. Um, and so now I'm looking for PhD programs that are doing interests that hold or have overlap with my own interest. And uh, one question I have is some of these institutes like Berkeley, um, I believe that like Cornell, like a handful of institutes really emphasize rotation on their website. And in some replies that I've gotten from professors is like, hey, you know, like we don't really have um, the, the kind of same approach as some institutes where we advocate for someone to be in our lab. So a lot of them will say like, oh, reach out to an advisor, you know, without that advisor support, your application process may, may or may not be as strong. So my question for you is with these institutes that do rotation sort of stuff, and they're not really like, you know, picking a student per se for their lab, what do you recommend as far as reaching out to these professors anyways, and even like explaining your background, expressing your interest, even though they may not have much of a say with your admissions? 
I can address that. I think that's really relevant to our program, which does have rotations. And this whole, like, should you email, should you cold email professors in advance is such a great one. It's really a cultural difference between different types of programs and different areas of study. At, at, at WashU, I think um, it's definitely true. There's like a place you can check on the, on the application that says, I spoke to so-and-so. And then we try to make sure that when you do an interview, you meet with the people that you already spoke to. Um, and we might try to make sure that that person is in on uh, discussions so that we're connecting people who have, we're connecting applicants with PIs of interest. In terms of but but I guess I would just say it's not required. So if you want to make those connections in advance, it's there's no harm. Nobody's like, oh, this annoying student keeps emailing me. I hate that. But if there's also an application that comes in and the person has made no contact, it doesn't influence their application in a negative way. That being said, if you have made some, and it needs to be like a real communication, it can help your application. But I wouldn't feel like you have to do it at all. And there may be some PIs who are just like, I don't really interact with students until they're here. So um, just don't be put off by that. Does that help? Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I am so... I'm older, so like I love talking to people <laughs> and reaching out to people. Um, if I could call people, I would, but I understand that you know things are are handled differently. But yeah, absolutely, that helps. I'm I am kind of more in the in the arena of like, hey, let me just reach out because why? How would this person really get to know me in any kind of way without doing that? So yeah, it's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, um, we had a few questions put in the chat. I'll, um, one of them is a multi-parter. Um, somebody's asking, they have a bachelor's degree. They would like a master's, but some programs seem to emphasize PhD and they're sort of unsure if they should just apply for PhD. This maybe is a little bit of a, a broader question of how do you know which, um, which path to take? Anybody wants to tackle that one? Well, I feel like I feel like we're all going to jump in at once. Um, uh, I guess for our program, um, we really emphasize that um, uh, students who are applying to the master's program, a big number, a big chunk of our students go into say state government, so it really is a terminal degree. So going getting a master's specifically because you want a job that needs a master's degree and nothing further. There are some students who uh, who get master's degrees with the intention of, of, of also getting a PhD here or elsewhere, who in those cases, it's primarily students who have very, very little undergrad research experience. Um, the Something that sort of a, some, maybe a behind the scenes sort of, of take is that a lot of universities, and I know that ours is one of them, um, there have been pressures from higher administration to de-emphasize master's programs because they don't go into sort of university level metrics of prestige. And so <laughs> it has been, difficult to get more resources for master's students. And so over time, our program has shifted from being about 50-50 master's and PhD to maybe two thirds to one third uh, balance of, of PhD versus master's. Um, and um, uh, so we really emphasize that students should be doing that based, like picking a program based on what they want to do with that degree, not just sort of what does the program seem to emphasize. Um, so that, that's sort of my, my perspective on it. Those are great points, and and I I, I want to emphasize that if if your lead is I want a master's, then that's probably what you should get. Right? And if your lead is I really want a PhD, well then that's what you should. There there I would never recommend to someone to just do a PhD because they think they should because both degrees are difficult and hard and really require a commitment. And so, um, if a master's is what you think you want, then then I I recommend doing that. Right. Um, that's it. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, don't apply for a PhD program with the thought that you will then exit with a master's. It's not going to serve you in the same way that programs that are designed to give you a master's degree will be, and it will be painful for everybody. So just go to one of these other these great programs. Actually, we're going the other direction, and our we've been talking about adding master's to our uh, programs. So I don't know. Every, everything's Everything in graduate school is kind of in flux these days, I feel. 
Um, I'm going to really quickly address the second part of this question was about the GRE. Um, GRE requirements are very variable across universities, so I would check with the specific university you're interested in. Some programs have dropped the requirement entirely. Um, I don't know how much it weighs into those that still require it. I don't have any experience with that. If somebody else wants to address that, but um, just do know that a lot of programs no longer require the GRE. Yeah, we ditched it. We actually blind our, our, our uh, admissions committee to it if anyone submits scores. Mm -hmm. We're in the midst of ditching it, but people can still submit if they want. And uh, if they're great scores, they can still help, right? But it won't hurt you to not submit. It's sort of where, we're at, where we are at this point. Same with like people talk about with GPA, but if your GPA is amazing, it can help you, right? But it won't necessarily kill you to not have the best GPA in the world. Okay, uh, we had a few questions about the statement of purpose, right? So this is the typically the document you need to submit when you apply to a graduate program. Um, and the question is, what do you look for in a statement of purpose? Um, yeah, th there were two questions on that topic. Uh, I'll share one thing that I, I really enjoy when I get to read, and that's getting to learn how you think scientifically. And um, oftentimes people share like stories of how they are, how they were drawn into science and why they want to pursue the degree. And I think on top of that, it's really interesting to understand a bit about your philosophy of tackling problems and how you think you can address them. And so I, I, um, when I see that in statements, I often like I think of that person as someone who has a great potential to be a thoughtful scientist. So that's one thing that I love to see, but they're not always there. I'd say the thing I really look forward to is seeing that people have a plan for the future or a, a really clear articulated reason for being in graduate school or for going to graduate school. That's not, I don't really know what to do, but I'm really good at school. So I'm just gonna keep doing more school, which is, I mean, it's not that it, that's a rare reason, but that won't get you very far. So I want to emphasize, though, that we don't like hold people to what they say. So people might say, I am just so excited about this area of research and I just really want to go into it. And then you arrive and you, you're like suddenly interested in something different. That's like not a problem. But the main point is that you're thinking about your future in some really proactive way and that graduate school is a part of it, I think, is what we want to see. I saw Chris shaking his head. Yes. So I think their program thinks the same way. Yeah, hundred percent on that. And and I guess the other thing I think that I look for is can you write? <laughs> right, writing is sort of like the currency that we all have in in academia. It'll be the same if you go into non academic professions, right? So I'm I'm looking at these statements and evaluating them for all sorts of things. But largely, I want to know if, if if a person is a good writer, right? Can you express your ideas in writing? Because the rest of your life is going to be spent doing that, right? Proposals and papers and communications and sharing information with non scientists. So um, I'm often looking for just sort of signs of, of writing skills and and being a, a good writer, right? So I think you can get lots of practice in writing in your life that really will benefit you, um, not just in your applications, but career-wise. One sort of last thing I didn't, I don't think I heard mentioned um, yet was uh, it's a great place uh, in, in general for personal statements to also discuss um, what you have done in the context of the opportunities that you were afforded. So one of the things we primarily do in the context of our sort of rubric-based admissions is to sort of uh, make sure that we are comparing students on an even footing with the opportunities that they have had access to. So if we get applicants, say, who are coming from small liberal arts colleges with fewer research labs or less access to undergrad research experience, so we aren't comparing that those students in terms of their output in, in undergrads, say poster presentations or things like that, to students who you know, we're in a big R1 and we're in research labs since they were, you know, sophomores or something like that. 
um, and students who happen to have access to things like REUs versus students who, who maybe didn't or because they had to work, let's say, uh, to support themselves during during college. So I think that the research statement or the personal statement, uh, statement of purpose um, is a really useful place to contextualize your accomplishments um, uh, and, and give that context to, to an admissions committee. Um, so we, 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 we use that information along with letters to better contextualize sort of what did this student do uh, to make use of the opportunities they were afforded. Um, to kind of spring off of that, there's a question in the chat about um, to what extent um, having experience in the field you're interested in is important, right? So I know a lot of times students maybe get experience in topic X, but they want to move into Y, how to sort of navigate that and does having less experience in a particular field necessarily decrease chance of getting um, admitted? To be honest, I think it can. So I think that what I've seen is people saying, I have a, de a degree in, in all of my experiences in animal research, but I've decided to move to plants because I think plant synthetic biology is the next great thing. And it's not that we don't agree with you. I think the fear is that some person in that position doesn't really know what they're getting themselves into and would be shocked by how slow sometimes plant research can be wouldn't, and would have like a very difficult time getting rolling. So I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying explain more in your, in your statement. And this is a great use of a personal statement, like exactly why you're interested in changing fields and how you would plan to make up sort of any perceived deficits in your background by uh, not having ever taken a plant biology class before or something like that. So I think the, the thing isn't to like be discouraged, but to understand that you would be starting perhaps at a different spot with some background knowledge and just discussing how you would approach that. For us as a direct admit program without rotations, it's very dependent on the individual advisor in terms of the amount of expectation of experience in, in a given discipline. In some labs, um, it's expected that you have this particular set of, of skills, say for field work, um, working with animals or already have a certain experience versus um, uh, other, other labs are open to just training students as long as they have some undergrad research or uh, other research experience. Um, so I'd say it's highly variable in our program. I'm going to jump in. So I just say the same. I mean, I'd be I'd be running against everything I tell my students in my department if I said that they would have to have some kind of background in what they go into because we're a small undergrad institution and they can only do what our faculty can offer them, right? So we don't cover all the things, <laughs> right? And you might be really interested in doing something aggressively. You just didn't have a chance to do, even take a course in it as an undergrad, right? So for us and for me personally, it's more about do you have that sort of have you had some kind of experience? Have you have you learned to do some science and, and can you speak to, as Liz said, can you speak to you know why you want to do it and maybe talk about the things that you still have to learn that you that you want to learn, right? So Um, okay, sorry, we're, <laughs> we're trying to hand off moderation. Um, but while we figure that out, I'll um, go back through the chat. Um, there was a question about good places to look for outside funding, but maybe we could um, open that up to a broader question about funding and sort of maybe what questions should you ask about funding when you are applying or contacting potential advisors? Well, I can say one thing maybe not to ask, especially in a rotation scenario is, will you be taking students in a year and a half from now? Because I have no idea. <laughs> like, I don't know what my funding cycle will, will give me. I don't know uh, who's graduating. I don't know if I'm taking a student this year, which will affect whether I take a student next year. So 
those kinds of questions can be they can be helpful to, if a, if a if a faculty member is like super old and they're like on the edge of retiring and you want to know if they're like no longer taking students but i think it can be tricky to ask like do you have funding for a student a year and a half from now because that's just not how our money works um, and actually in our program students are funded their first year by the program and so then you're actually asking whether i have money for like four years, two years from now. And like, I honestly have no idea. So I, with programs with the rotation system, I would be careful how you ask those questions, not because you're going to offend, but only because you may not get an answer that feels useful, if that makes sense. And possibly questions that can help you understand what like the backdrop of funding is on average. In, you, in the department you might be joining um, would be more useful. So how many students are funded for on RAs you know, per year? How many tend to TA? And so some institutions, students will TA many semesters to support themselves. In other institutions, there's not a lot of TAing and there's a lot of um, research assistantships available from the PIs or even from the from the university or the department. So getting a feel for what's typical can often be um, more helpful than trying to peg exactly what's going to work out for a particular faculty member. Yeah, plus one what Jen said, I think that's exactly right. Another question you can ask about is whether there is bridge funding for students whose faculty have run out of money, like just ask generically what would happen if that were the case. Um, I think every institution has a way to deal with that that is nothing to worry about, but it can give you context and some some information there. Um, and for our program, um, so when we admit students, we guarantee them uh, TA funding as a safety net for X number of years, three years for, for master's students and six years for PhD students. Um, they don't always use all of that, but it's there as a floor. Um, and then replaced with RAs or fellowships. Um, summer funding is not guaranteed, but is is competitive. And so those are sort of important things to, I think to ask uh, potential graduate advisors about is like, how is it structured? Because it's different everywhere. Um, but um, in our case, we one way we try to recruit is to make sure that that is that support is guaranteed in writing at the time that the student is accepting an offer of admission. Um, and so, uh, but summer support or supplemental funding, say a supplemental additional number of hours per week doing research on an RA or something during the academic year are things that can be negotiated by individual faculty advisors. Um, so there's additional mechanisms that are faculty lab specific based on availability of funds. I do want to state that this is this is difficult um, also because the levels of stipend in in my department, for example, does vary with the PI. So we don't have a set standard. And so unfortunately, students who end up in different labs might be paid different levels and it's hard to know in advance what that's going to look like. So um, I'm not saying it's a good policy. It happens to be the policy we have right now. And just quickly on this conversation, not every school offers stipends for master's students, right? So where I did my master's program, I paid for the tuition and the PhD students all had assistantships, right? Here we off, we only have master's programs, so we support them with stipends, but it, that will vary as well, right? Some schools don't give you assistantships if you're a master's student, and that's worth knowing. <laughs> and or the stipend levels might be different for the same assistantship work, you know, being, say, being a TA. In ours, we have a $6,000 gap between PhD and master students for what is effectively the same work. Trying to get that changed, but up until now and at the present moment, it's that differential um, because it's not viewed as compensation for labor. It's viewed as a stipend to help cover your, your living expenses while participating in the program. Um, but that's, that's it's again, highly variable among institutions. Emmanuel, did you want to take over? 
Oh, yeah, sorry. I was like trying to write you a note while. <laughs> We're trying to multitask inefficiently over here. Um, so I think we'll go to Barty's question first, and then we'll go back to questions in the chat. Thank you. Um, how appropriate or inappropriate might you feel if you're having a good conversation with, with a student that you feel would be a good candidate for your lab, and there's most likely, in some cases, three letters of recommendation for the application process. If that individual were, how appropriate or inappropriate do you feel it might be that that student ask you if the conversation seemingly is going well? Um, and then being a prospective student, they ask you to be uh, one of their letters of recommendation. So in our program, we only allow that if a faculty member is recruiting like one of their own undergrads that they've worked with for a year plus, let's say. And so they really are one of the letter writers because they know from working with the student. We don't really expect or really permit that to be considered. We don't we don't allow our faculty to write a letter for a student they haven't worked with um, just sort of like pitching them like that's part of the process already. Like they they fill out the rubric for the student and sort of give their assessment and endorsement at that time, but not like as a letter of rec in terms of the required number of letter recommendations that a student needs to provide, at least for our program. Um, so we have, uh, how do you decide that an applicant seems like a good candidate and ready for grad school? I think I said that correctly. Yeah, I mean, that's the question, isn't it? That's why we have applications and interviews and, <laughs> and uh, uh, rotations, really, uh, so we have as long a time as possible to get get a handle on people what people are doing i would say that in the in just the paper application um we really want to see in the statement of research that you um can describe the research that you've done in a way that's coherent in a way that provides enough background for us to understand why it's important that says not just what you did but why you did it and what you found so I think when, when I think of applications that feel like, oh, this person's not ready yet, they might have research experience, but it just lists experiments or, or techniques without telling me why the experiment was done or what they got out of it or what the next steps would be. So that sort of contextualizing the little, the, the PCR reaction is what we kind of want to see. And that gives us a sense that you're, ready to launch into the next stage of, of real intensive uh, lab work. Liz, I perceive it similarly when I see a list of, of techniques that you, you've practiced and it's simply a list with very little context, it's, I have concerns about your preparedness. I would say for our program, it's sort of, we use this rubric process so in, in terms of trying to make sure students are like explaining why they want this degree and what research they plan to do. But given that we have a really diverse set of faculty across biology, um, from plants to animals to microbes and genetics to ecology, that we really leave a lot of that up to the individual faculty member. And so those interactions and interview, really interviews, um, informal interviews uh, leading up to the application are really important. So like a faculty endorsement of a student is in including that they have judged that this student is going to be able, likely to be successful in the program in doing the research that they are being recruited into that lab potentially to do that area of work. So because it's so 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 specific, I can't I can't judge whether someone can do genomics or bioinformatics very, you know, well or has the background or the is thinking correctly about those sorts of questions. Similarly, I can't do that about oceanographic work. So like I, I, we basically leave a lot of that up to the individual recruiting faculty member to sort of judge the nuances of preparedness. But we just look for, can you articulate a question well? Can you explain your logic of why you want to do certain kinds of research at sort of the admissions committee level? Yeah, all of that from everyone, um, including a Chase's point in our program. And a lot of it comes down to the potential PI, but uh, also, um, you know, the, 
the preparedness is one thing, but so is the, as has come up before, um, the sort of the why you want to do it, right? And so uh, if a person really articulates why this is important to them and what their goals are and what they're going to be doing next, that's a big part of sort of our decisions that we make is that, do you know what this entails and, and are, you, are you ready for it? And are, is it is it what you want to do? And do you have you know, goals in mind for, for getting there. Right. And so I uh, just, honestly, grad school's hard, right. We all have, as many of us have experienced that. And so being prepared and knowing that it's going to be a challenge and that you're up for it and ready to do it is, um, is good to know. Um, we'll take a question from Skylar, but I did want to just respond to something in the chat. Um, Piper, there is a spreadsheet somewhere floating on Twitter about master's programs, like everywhere, US and not in the US. And I'm trying to find it, but it's very hard to look through retweets. Um, but uh, thank you, Carolina. And uh, I think when we send out um, like the thank you email, we'll include that um, in if we don't find it right now. Um, but yes, Skylar, please ask your question. Hi. Um, so I, would, I just thought I would ask this out loud because it's kind of easier to do that. But so if you, if an advisor from a school has told you that they would support you and provide funding for you, and um, like when you do the application process that they would say that they could serve as your advisor, how can you tell them, or is it appropriate to say that, um, yes, like, thank you, I'm, I will like do the application process, but I still like want to look at other schools and other options. Like, how do you say that in like a um, in a good way, and like, is that okay to ask uh, to tell them that? And should they expect that as a, an advisor? I'll yes, jump in hearing none. Oh, go ahead, Chris. Go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, yes, they should expect that, right? I mean, because there's a pretty yeah. good group that if somebody's got an active lab, they're also talking to other students, right? So it's perfectly okay. But it's great to know you got somebody in your corner for when you do apply, right? But um, perfectly okay for you to say thanks. I'm going to apply, and you know, and to have other possibilities for yourself. And in that same vein, like, okay, most labs you'd be applying to have someone, undergrad or master student, applying for other programs outside of the art lab. Like, think about how that faculty member would be advising their own students. Like, I always advise my students, like, you need to be applying to a minimum of five programs. You need you need safety schools, and then you need an insurance policy if things don't work out because you could have a faculty member who absolutely wants to take you and expects to get uh you know uh funding let's say let's say it was expecting to get a ta funding not a teaching citizenship funding versus something that's funded from a grant and you may want to go to that school and it might be like the absolute number one pick for you and it might be you might be the faculty member's number one pick and the funding just doesn't work out for a variety of reasons in terms of how resources are allocated within a department who knows there could be budget cuts it could be that not enough students graduated didn't free up ta lines etc so like there's a bunch of contingency in this. It's not like applying to, to undergrad where you're just one of a whole bunch of students and you're getting in based on some generic merit score. Um, it's really the individual the individual aspect of this um, means that it can just not work out. And so it, it would be silly to not expect students to apply to a bunch of different programs. And anyone who's, I think anyone who's sort of like, who would, who would view that poorly either doesn't know what how programs work or how admissions works and so i feel like you want to be polite and frank but polite about it and and maybe frank about it and maybe you want to fray if someone has a grant funds and like knows for certain they could they could fund you um then maybe you want to nuance it a little bit in terms of saying something like you know just just in case or you know as an insurance i'm applying to other programs too although you're my maybe top pick or something even if that may or may not be the case but like i think that you should be it, it would be silly for faculty not to understand that students have to apply to multiple programs. That's just how this works. Thank you. That's helpful. I think uh, this could lead into another question we got earlier, um, which I, I think, sorry, I was like, obviously on Twitter just now. Um, the question that we that would have. It was about, Carolina, do you know which question I'm talking about? When is it time to stop uh, trying to contact an unresponsive advisor? So as you're doing your grad school search, how many emails is too many?
if no one's gonna jump in, I'll jump in again. Um, so uh, I recommend to my students to send one cold email, follow up two weeks later, and hear, if you hear nothing, move on. That's my general advice. Um, sometimes faculty just miss stuff. I get like 100 emails a day in my inbox. I miss things, they slide by. So it's helpful to follow up. But if you're just emailing someone over and over again and you're not getting a response, just move on. Like you're, you're kind of wasting your time. Like you should be emailing lots of different faculty members rather than trying to email the same ones over and over again and not getting a response. Um, I don't I know, will some say, faculty are not responding. Don't send it Friday afternoon. Those emails got way more lost than any other emails. So don't send these out on Friday afternoon. <laughs> Um, I'd recommend you have a spreadsheet of like who you emailed when and then like when you successfully followed up because as you start emailing like lots of different prospective advisors, it gets really easy to get lost with all that stuff. So if you can keep track of it somehow versus just like scrolling through your email sent folder, like I think it, it's important to keep track of it or document uh, that and that can be helpful so that you're making sure that you aren't emailing the same faculty over and over and over, but also so that you know you did follow up with someone and they didn't just miss your first email. I want to hear what Liz has to say on this. <laughs> yeah, I think I agree with what everybody's saying, which is um, give uh, people a second chance because stuff gets lost, but then I, I wouldn't, and also I wouldn't read anything into it. Um, not me, of course but many of my colleagues are terrible at answering their emails and they just are bad at it. And it doesn't mean they don't, aren't interested in you or wouldn't be excited about having you in their lab. It might just be that they just try not to spend their whole life on email. So I would just, uh, yeah, try it once, try again, give like much more than 24 hours later, please. And then um, just move on. Um, but it doesn't, mean, don't read anything into it. Um, Sierra has a follow-up question to that. What should someone say in that second email? Should it just be a gentle reminder that you sent the other email? Yeah, I usually recommend that. Like, just reply to the original so it's there and you can see the date and, like, you know, how long has it been that you waited, like a week, two weeks, whatever. But just like a, hi, Dr. So-and-so, um, just following up my email below in case you missed it. Thanks very much. That's sufficient. It's just to bring it back to the top of the inbox. So just reply yep. to the original one so it's all there. Perfect. Uh, so more about, I guess, choosing schools. Somebody asked a question before, how many should you apply to? But also, how important is it to go to the right or the correct school? Um, I'll just say that I don't think it's always necessarily about the institution or the school. I think it's very often about the advisor, right? It's about the lab and the person that you're working with, right? So, so finding that person is really important. Um, and you can, you know, track Twitter and see what happens with with folks who didn't find an advisor who they worked well with, and it, it can get it can get pretty rough, right? So, um, that's my one thing I'll say is that it's often the people you work with that matters a little bit more than the institution, but some might say differently. And to piggyback on that, I think that I, I absolutely agree that the advisor is super, super important. You need a supportive advisor, but a supportive advisor in a toxic department, whereas maybe a mediocre advisor in a really supportive program. Eh. So like, I think the program more than the university, because that's kind of big and nebulous, but like the program also matters. Do grad students seem happy in the program? <laughs> Does the program actually have a good graduation rate? Does it get, are, do students who leave this program actually get jobs? In, in desired jobs. Um, those are questions that the program should have some data on or some information on. Um, uh, in terms of the number of programs to apply to, um, when working with my students, um, I recommend like five as a minimum number, but that's my perspective in terms of just looking at students who've applied to different numbers of programs and the, the likelihood of success. And for me, it feels like that's about the tipping point and applying to that number or more. It's a very good shot of getting at least one funded offer uh, of, a, of a program. Below that, it gets risky, at least in my experience with my, my students over the past decade. Um, we have a question. Uh, should my interest be 100% in line with the lab that I am applying to? Uh, 
while you guys uh, think about that, can I, can I just, I just wanted to make one comment about this, like, uh, is there, how, how do I know what the one advisor or the one program is for me? And I just wanted to like, I'm kind of dial down the worry there. There's not like a one-to-one -one correlation between you and the, like the one perfect advisor and the one perfect program out there. There are probably hundreds of places you would flourish. When I think about my wonderful students, they would have been successful anywhere they went. <laughs> like, it's not about me. It's about them and what they bring. And so for all of you out there, the same thing is true. You will do great in many, many places. And just there's not like the one, um, like the prince for if you're like a princess, it's like, like a prince. So that's a very gendered example. But there is no one perfect solution for you. There's many, many um, paths you could go down. And I just... I hope that feels like less stressful that you're like trying to find the perfect uh, outcome. And I think that really re reflects why rotation programs are often very popular too, right? Because there's probably a lot of options that when you start off looking at the list of faculty that you might want to rotate with, there's, you, you, you have several. And maybe you have in mind that you're going to go to one, but maybe that won't be what happens and, and that they all would have worked out well. And I think that kind of gets that 100% in line. Should your interests align 100%? I mean, is it possible for your interests to align 100%? I have some doubts, right? Like you might have a slightly different take on something. So just to push it to the extreme, the answer, I, I think the answer is definitely not 100%, but probably some percent, <laughs> not zero. I, I think that from both my own experience experiences and uh, running admissions and having faculty members you know, come talk and sort of like give me the heads up on their student that's applying. Um, the, the students that often seem to be the most like the most exciting to faculty members are ones who have enough overlap, but a different set of experiences or, or skills from their advisors so they can take the research in a different direction. So like if you're coming from a background and you have a piece of information or a piece of knowledge or background or skill set that is complementary to what the lab's already doing that's like awesome in a lot of cases so i think if, if you have that then that's 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 wonderful so yeah not lining up 100 percent um but but having that overlap so that you know there's the beneficial aspects of having overlap with your advisor but also being able to take it the research in a novel direction um absolutely awesome um i have a follow-up question for those of you uh who uh are participate in uh or are involved in programs that have rotations. It sounds like that's both uh, Liz and Jennifer. Is it both of you have rotations in your programs? Not really. Okay. Not Jennifer, but 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 Liz. Okay. Um, so I have a question about that. Um, uh, for Liz, um, do you have students who get stuck in like the game of musical chairs that don't have an advisor? Because that's been one of my sort of major concerns in terms of talking with students applying to programs about those that applying to programs that do and don't have rotations. Um, like, do you have a, do you have situations where they do students do rotations and then don't have a like a, a, an advisor at the end of it? No, we don't. And the reason is that is because we have so many more PIs than we have a very small program and many many PIs who are all desperate to have graduate students um, in our labs. Um, and so that doesn't happen. It is it has happened before that people have. So we typically do three every now and then. A student comes along who does like four or even five rotations just because they are trying to find that perfect fit um but nobody ever comes out the other end and is like what do i do now uh, but it's mostly because the balance between students and advisors it may be different in other programs where there are fewer pis okay is the funding vested in the student then it sounds like so whenever they join a lab is it that that funding moves with the student into a lab or is it a situation where that funding is for the first year and then the, the PI picks that up uh, for like the second year and beyond. Yeah, it's number two. Yeah, okay. it's number two. But um, yeah, so I guess it might be possible that you would rotate in a lab that then didn't have the funds for you, but um, typically that would you wouldn't end up doing that rotation. People would let you know when you arrived what your options were. Cool. Yeah. Um, so... We got another question, and this is more about finding advisors. Um, how do you know if a meeting with the PI went well? Because sometimes they're a little vague, sometimes they're very clear. Like, how do you end up deciding which is the one? Uh, 
well, they give you a ring, right? <laughs> no, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I guess for the rotation programs, everybody has conversations and it's sort of all the power is in the students' hands. So the way it works in my program is you do the rotation and the students are like, I, this is the lab I've decided to join, or I want to join your lab if you'll have me kind of thing. Um, but in these other programs where you're sort of picking out a PI in advance, I'm not sure how that works, actually. There must be some application process and then dialogue. I don't know. Yeah, so so speaking about that sort of program, um, so uh, are you refer? I guess the, I'm going to take this question two ways. One, assuming you're talking about, like, how do I know whether or not I should actually follow through with applying to a program? Is this PI actually serious? Should I actually go through the trouble of submitting my applications and paying for transcripts and all that stuff? Um, so in that instance, I think it's important to be really frank in terms of basically saying, like, OK, will you endorse my application? And you need to ask questions about how the program works and if that's a step that's important. But for most direct admit programs, that's an important step. Like, for example, in our program, we don't even evaluate students who aren't faculty endorsed because we can't force a faculty member to take a student. So um, I think that that is pre pre application. That's a really important question to sort of like, how do you know if this PI is serious? Because I have students off, often who are my undergrads who are applying to programs who are like getting really vague answers from faculty. And it seems like they just want them to apply and waste their time. So I think it's important to like. Uh, extract from that faculty member in an email or verbally on Zoom or something, the equivalent of like, yes, I will endorse your application. You should apply. I want you in my lab. Post-application, if you're thinking about like, which lab is the right fit for me, I think it's critical that you not just focus on the sing the advisor, but also other graduate students in that lab, in that department, uh, ideally, if you go and visit, uh, either through organized recruitment weekends or other things, but get other perspectives on whether this is a healthy environment, a supportive environment, and an environment which you're going to do well. Um, and I think that 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 is that sort of decision you have until April 15th, if the place you're applying is part of the Council of Graduate Schools, April 15th resolution treaty amongst schools. Um, but uh, I think that you have a longer period of time and you should get as much information as possible. Um, I'm not sure to which side of the application deadline sort of you were referring, but hopefully that was my perspective on both of them. Yeah, I think if to follow up on all that, I think if you're uh, if the person you're talking to does not say does not encourage you to apply and to say like, yeah, you really should apply to the program and then we'll see where it goes from here. And, you know, I'm interested in the possibility of working with you, then it's actually OK to also ask. Right. Even just to ask, do you you know, would you encourage me to apply to the program? Right. And their answer might be really telling. Right? And so I feel like if a person is unwilling to give you an answer to that question, they're probably not going to be a great match for you anyway, right? Remember that that this is the first sort of real interaction you're having with this person. And if from the get-go you feel like you're not getting honest answers and not being treated with respect and not, and they don't understand how important this decision is for you, then it might be time to look elsewhere. All right, so we are, uh, we have like four ish minutes left. Um, I would like to plug the link that Carolina sent about the, um, the, what is that end of event survey? So if you could post that to the end of the chat, that'd be fantastic. And uh, I guess uh, last question for the panelists would be what what parting wisdom do you have on these future applicants in this uh, workshop right now? I just wanted to bring up if you have any financial hardship in terms of paying application fees, um, please reach out to the programs. There are often waivers available or exceptions that can be made. So don't let that stop you from applying to the number of schools that you think you need to to get into a graduate school. I can leave one party and comment that is kind of a um, response to, I think a question I saw in the chat, which was how do I write a personal statement that sounds like bragging? Um, and I would first try to write it as if you were writing it about somebody else. Imagine you're like your own advisor or your own best friend and try and write it that way and then and see how that feels but just try not to try to see what it would read as if you were talking about somebody else and sometimes that can help you put some of the more um 
uh, things that put aside that sense of weirdness around what feels like bragging, but is really just informing the committee about your, your skill sets. And we want to know, I guess that's maybe the second thing is like, we actually really love reading your applications. We love meeting you. Like it feels like it's a gatekeeping thing and it is in a, in a way, but also like we're so, everybody on the committee is so enthused about graduate students. You're everybody's favorite part of being a PI is our graduate students. We love you. And so just know that we're excited to read about you and um, maybe going into it with that attitude will help you feel okay about bragging about your skills. Yeah, I could. Uh, yes, thank you for saying that, Liz. And and you know there there is a there's a power dynamic here, and everybody goes in feeling kind of intimidated, and you sort of imagine that you want these people to pick you, and and um, that they are the ones that have something to offer to you, and this would be such this amazing thing if you get accepted, right? But it it really does go the other way too, right? You're you're all coming into these programs as educated, really smart, interesting people, and you're bringing something too, right? So to Liz's point, right? Talk about that, right? Talk about what you're bringing, and and be proud of that, right? Um, come in and, and understand that they are also looking for really collaborators and partners in science and you're and you're bringing that even though there is this feeling that they're like these professors and you are coming in as a student, right? It's a, once you get in the in the in there, if it's a good lab, you're going to feel like you're part of a team and a collaborator, not not a, a person who's sort of at some lower level, right? So come in with that kind of attitude, right? You got something to offer. So show it. 100% agree with that, especially like that's that's so under, I think, under recognized by applicants is that faculty are actively like fighting to get good students that that have relevant experiences or relevant interests into their in, into their lab groups and into our departments. I mean, our department has about a in any given year, 40 to 50 percent offer decline rate. And so, you know, folks are applying to multiple programs. And when folks apply to multiple programs, that means they say no to a lot of programs. And so I think that it is important to remember that faculty are in many cases recruiting you as well as hard or harder than you are applying to programs. I think Chris is 100% on point there. Um, so I think thinking about yourself as making this big sort of decision in your life of where you're going to move for the next handful of years to half a decade um, to get higher higher education in this particular field, um, thinking about what you need to be successful over that period of time. Um, think long term. Don't just think about like getting into a program. Think about like choosing programs based on your likelihood of being able to be happy and healthy and successful over what might be half a decade um, or or maybe less than that if it's a master's program. So I think um, that's critical to have that longer view. That would be my, my sort of parting words. Well, thank you all for being here and a special thank you to our panelists for talking for an hour about everything that they know um, please uh, fill out the survey um, so we can figure out how to host events like this in the future. And uh, yeah, Carolina, do you have anything to say? Nope. Thanks everybody for being here. Appreciative of all the panelists taking an hour out of the day. We're very thankful for you. Uh, and good luck everybody uh, applying and finding the right fit for grad school. Thanks everybody. Good seeing everyone.